all it ultimately does in the hobby is causes misery. One of those few scenarios, mate, in life where... I think the issue is nowadays, we're all led to believe if you ain't got a drum, shit. There's still no harm and shame in creating your filter out of dustbins. I don't give a fuck. I don't care what anyone says about me saying that. That's true. Just to remember a conversation with some guy, it blew my head to pieces. There's no answer for it, just like it was cool to say it. There's not one shred of my experience that tells me that's going to light things up differently to any other media. Fucking oh, you know, hell, this game is costing me a lot of money. I think this is where you're going to learn everything you need to learn here. Welcome back, everyone, to another uh, session in the podcast studio with myself, Chris Wall, and Ricky Stoddart. Alan, people. Alan, Chris. How are we doing, mate? Oh, buzzing. Buzzing as always, yeah. It's uh, yeah, good to be back. A little sort of uh, sessions that we have in here, sort of putting the koi world to right. So, yeah, this week uh, we've got a subject that I think will just bring everyone down to earth a little bit, just simplify the hobby. I think it's sometimes when I'm looking on social media uh, videos with people setting their ponds up, I can see why the hobby becomes quite expensive. I'm going to love this one, aren't I? Yeah, I feel you're sort of gripping the table as we speak. So we, we before even before we sort of started collaborating and working together, we both had similar mantras uh, of, you know, keep it simple, you know, don't overcomplicate things. Sometimes n n don't take that literally, you know, you still need the basics of koi keeping, mm -hmm. but certainly overcomplicating scenarios and then causing stress as a result of that to yourself and your your pond. Uh, but mixed within all of that is the physical cost. So the, basically this session is going to be about exploring uh, your koi budget. Now, this is not just specific to purchasing koi, but also affiliated, you know, the, your actual physical pond build, the filters that you use, the running costs, everything about it, where you could pull back, where you can gain, you might as well just jump in now. It's going to be a bumper episode, <laughs> isn't it? I've got goosebumps. <laughs> so we've got to start somewhere. So I guess in a good place to start is your actual pond build design, that actual physical process of going, right, I want to build a koi pond. Yeah. Take it away. I'll sit back. <laughs> No, mate, I, just, just from the bits you've said alone, I mean, it does blow my mind, some of the stuff that I see. I think probably one of the biggest lines here, and there'll be a lot of hobbyists watching this as well that, you know, see people, and this, you can't help this in life, but, you know, people coming into the hobby throwing in insane amounts of money at it, definitely loads of scenarios of all the gear and no idea going on here. And yeah, I mean, this is the whole thing. I've watched afar from all this stuff for absolutely ages and see how people get themselves in sort of so deep with stuff. All it ultimately does in the hobby is causes misery. And the first thing I will say here in all this is no amount of money you will spend will compensate or replace experience mm. and hands-on experience. doesn't matter. The only way you can buy that and sort of bypass that stage is by having somebody there holding your hand all the way who, who can bolt on that experience to whatever kit piece of, piece of kit it is you bought and scenario that you're in. That's where, again, over the years, back to my shop days, I've seen people succeed really well is when they have been the kind of people that came, listened to my guiding voice and only my guiding voice, gave me all the feedback when things were not going right, We've nursed them through it, and away they go. But yeah, you can't. The minute there's more than one guiding voice in that that scenario it falls to pieces. Everything. Yeah. So yeah, pond builds. Where do we start with that, mate? Really? Well, I'll, I'll bring up a scenario that threw it reared mm. its head last week for me. So chatting to a guy, um, similar scenario, pockets of information left, right, and centre. Ends up asking my opinion. We're talking about bottom drains, you know. I think we can both agree that they're advantageous, you know. Yep. Uh, you know, I don't think either of us are going to argue if someone wants to put bottom drains on their pond. Uh, but we're talking about aerated bottom drains. And the notion that he was fed, they are pivotal 
if you're going to have a bottom drain, you must have an aerated bottom drain. Right, okay. What, what's your pond dimensions? Two metres wide by six metres. How many bottom drains? Put the three bottom drains on. Right, okay. All three. aerated? Did you say three? Yeah. All, all aerated? Wow. Uh, yeah, that's the advice. Do you not want to see your fish? Mm. I was like, that's... Uh, uh, but here's here's the thing. Because I went against the advice of professionals, he yep. just went, well, that's going to save me a fortune putting non-aerated bottom drains in. So this is one of those few scenarios, mate, in life <laughs> where you can sort of save yourself some money. Uh, okay, there might be marginal gains in terms of... Uh, air displacing water to create that drawing effect mm. but i often find that half the time with an aerated bottom drain when particles are moving down naturally anyway they get blasted to the surface because you've got a volcano of air going Plus on it's the a pond. very disruptive flow pattern for koi yeah feeding the behavior of the koi they're not used to being having something shoving against them while they're trying yeah. to swim down or pushing them down when they're trying to come up, if you you name it. Yeah. So, know. I mean, I've never sort of been a, an advocate of them, but I did get pressured a few times just because under customer duress. Mm -hmm. No, that's what I want. Like, you know, I'm not exact. Uh, certainly larger ponds, like big surface areas, I don't really have a massive issue with it in those where fish have got the ability to, to move away from it and yep. it doesn't disrupt the viewing uh, uh, aesthetics of it, but mm -hmm. it just blew my mind that multiple professionals were adamant that if you do not put aerated bottom drains on, your pond won't work properly. Yeah, see, it's a really old way of thinking, uh, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. It's like tangential returns, they just absolutely make me piss every time yeah. I hear someone mm. go into that amount of effort to create a vortex in the pond. And for what? Yeah, to make your fish lopsided. Yeah. Which has been known to be the case with Yeah, it. yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've seen it. Yeah, there's one of them, mate. I feel like this is uh we should have a list prepped here of all these <laughs> old scenarios. It, it, it's again, I've mentioned it previously about uh this sort of old boy syndrome where just things don't change. No, it's the same old shit just passed down from one un one educated person to another, really, or one salesman uh, and to then, another. And then it becomes gospel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the advice that I was given uh, wholeheartedly stood by it. But I then have a, a set of opposed yeah. professionals or so-called professionals. Oh, people selling bottom drains. Yeah, yeah. Um, be careful. So, yeah, just uh, ironically, that scenario popped up just literally a matter of days ago. I think from when you've said this, I'm sat here as we're talking, it's bubbling away in the back of my head is how do we, how do I tackle what you've just put forward here? And I've already said it. You cannot put a price on your knowledge. That's the biggest thing. And obviously everybody starting out hasn't got that. That's where you fall short. So how do we tackle that? Just don't go crazy. Listen to the fact of you don't need all these fancy bells and whistles. Probably the biggest thing here I can do is, and this is something I think I've said in my question time live, is that people these days, I think, understand the concept of filtration less than they used to, probably going back 15 to 20 years. And by that, I mean, in the, the days of bay filters, or even that, not just bay filters, because bay filters give you some customization options. Yeah, you could you could have different kind of water flow patterns in them depending depending on how the baffles were designed. You got chambers that you could play with, put different setups inside them. Uh, you could buy one pre-made, or you could design your own system and block build it. All these things were a big part then, considering which different medias you went for and all the rest of it. I'm not, I'm not saying that's all good. Uh, because there's, there's loads of different options. I think it's become more standardized to K1 and fluid beds these days, which I think is a good thing. But you had these options and you kind of had to learn about different scenarios of filtration, mechanical, biological. It's so much more plug and play now. Mm. It's, more, it's more a case of not talking about flow rates or how many chambers or filter size or anything like that. It's, is it a Nexus or is it a drum? It's become so much more standardized mm. like that. And it's like, well, or is it a combi drum? You just stick one of them on and everything's done. 
There's no looking at retention times. Any of these things which all make such a massive, massive difference to you. I mean, you're not going to know at this point if a hobbyist, where you want to be as a hobbyist, unfortunately, which can make a big difference. Because again, me looking at designing a pond, is this just an ornamental pond in your garden? Do I want to keep a nice collection, but I'm not too fussed about, you know, pushing them, growing them? Or do I want a raising pond to really push fish hard? Because every one of those scenarios, I'm going to come out from a completely different angle in the initial design. But in the initial design, not one of these systems needs thousands and thousands of pounds spending on it. That's probably where I'm going to stress straight away. You can still design a filter and build it yourself. There's still no harm and shame in creating your filter out of dustbins. I don't give a fuck. I don't care what anyone says about me saying that. That's true. If that was the difference between you getting into the hobby and not getting into the hobby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make it out of dustbins. Who gives a shit? Because ultimately you can make it work if you spend a little bit of time understanding the concepts behind filtration. That's it. Mm. Plain and simple. And a lot of the times these things can actually end up better than the products you'll go and buy off the shelf, so to speak. Yeah, you know? a bit of an irony to that, isn't there? That's why I did it with the uh, the trickle towers you see at, uh, at the farm because I was looking at for an off-the-shelf solution that would fit into that space, basically, that I had and would give me good biological capacity and good mechanical filtration. So what did I derive at? Well, there was nothing off the shelf. And a good point here is, is how some of this marketing and groups of people and people selling you stuff can make you feel that it's not the right choice or an inferior choice. Because I even started questioning myself. It's like, does any of this stuff work anymore? I was like, spoke to my dad, we need to design ourself i need to make something so we found the plastic containers that work well pumice stone because again if we boil it down here biological media anything that's in water that has water running over it and is wet will grow bacteria on mm. it it's just a case of how well and how much it can colonize for the space that you give to it you know pebbles will colonize bacteria if you've got water running over them they'll develop biofilm on and they'll do a job you know, so went right, pumice, quite a cheap, porous rock, fantastic. We went with that. And then you come to the the sticker, I think, that a lot of people overlook mechanically. What do we do? And it's like people have forgotten the fact of part of the hobby used to be rolling your sleeves up and cleaning your filters out. Yeah. Uh, so we went with foam. It's a super efficient mechanical media. It's great. It does have its downsides, don't get me wrong, i.e. how much it needs cleaning, yeah. it does need yeah, replacing, yeah. but it does a cracking job. So I've created this system that stands in a, a very, very small space with huge biological capacity and good mechanical one for a pittance of money Yeah, in the grand scheme of things. And they, aren't they? they are bomb-proof, mm. these things. And they replaced a very, very well-known branded system that was on there that also fit in a small footprint which although it was easy to clean because of the nature of it pump feeding and having to refill during cleaning cycles, we actually had a huge time saving from all that as well. Scaled up over the 20 odd filters it replaced. Yeah, yeah. It was bonkers. It's like, I can't forget, you know, go back to the, it's knowledge. We understand how a filter works. Foam does a cracking job. I think the issue is nowadays, we're all led to believe if you ain't got a drum, shit. It's the thing. There's... No drum equals shit yeah. pond. Or can't no. keep coy. Yeah. There's not a lot of sex appeal behind a bit of sponge, though, is there? I don't know. Make some funky shapes out of it. Depends where you're putting it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, in terms of... The the basics of koi keeping seem to have sort of gone out the window a little bit with complexities. Yeah. Uh, every time I have a discussion with people, they're bringing in aspects of the hobby where it's like... You've not even mastered the basics yet. Please don't move on to areas that you know, nitrate comes up all the time. You know, people trying to get nitrate down to zero when they're perhaps feeding their koi sawdust, or you know, what I mean, or, or you know, before you get on to these very finite aspects of the hobby, mm. nail the basics. Mm. One of the other things that is constantly up for discussion 
And another reason why bottom drains have, or, or multiple bottom drains are becoming so uh, utilised is flow rates. There you go. You just said it. I mean, flow rates, that's got me thinking drums because all of a sudden a drum's got four inlets on it, which means I can have yeah four drains which means flow that. rate. And that's how I was actually, as I was sat there, then I'm piecing loads of scenarios together because you said about obviously maximising yep. on your, uh, your kind of budget of what you've got. And... Yeah, I've kind of lost my thread with that, to be fair. But the bottom drains is a massive issue. Flow rates is a massive issue. And I think that's something that's gone out of the window. That was where I was at. So all of a sudden, backy showers come into the market whenever they did, at what point that entered. That does allow you to run a higher flow mm, system. Yeah. Question is, do you need a high flow rate in your system? The creation of high flow rates seem to make people forget about the conversation about retention times. Retention time is not a conversation really to have with a shower. It's not really what it's about. But in submerged filtration, yeah. huge, huge thing to talk about. Really, really important as well. But all of a sudden, and this is what happens, is more products come in com over commercializing things. It makes people forget about a lot of these basic concepts and just probably changes that viewpoint. So, yeah, all of a sudden we've got showers. Oh, we need a high flow rate. 90% of ponds out there do not need to turn over once, more than once every couple of hours. Mm. They just don't because there's not enough food, anything going in there to do it. And when you've got a submerged filtration system and you start getting to the point of going over once every two hours, I know you from old data calculations, the retention time will fall through the floor, which you don't want. Again, that can be counteracted, but again, you're looking at then designing a system based on specifics, i.e. in order to get this flow rate that I want, say once every, once an hour, and the pond size that you've got will mean I will need a biological chamber of X size in order to get the retention time required. Nobody, I guarantee you, there's very few people looking at this when they're designing a system out there. What's become a thing is, say, flow rates become such a massive thing, and and the, the industry is to blame. Really, so it's easy to sell, isn't it? More is yeah. better. You know, this this filter can handle four thousand liters an hour. Fantastic. That doesn't mean that four thousand liters an hour is the right flow rate to put through it for your pond. Mm. Like I say, this came in, so all of a sudden showers. Wow, I need to be turning over. I still remember a conversation with some guy. It blew my head to pieces. You know, he said, oh, I'm turning it over, you know, once every 20 minutes. Wow. Just wow. I, I, why? I couldn't I couldn't get past why. There was no answer for it, just like it was cool to say it. Yeah. Well, another, another thing is obviously classic scenario, uh, decent size combi drum, got three or four, four inch inlets. Yep. Uh, Want to maximize flow rate. Mm. Yeah, it'll take up to... 60,000 litres an hour. The bio chamber on that, on oh, the combi damn. drum, was about half a metre in Here length. Go. To occupy, so that he could then run it through a shower. So I was like, mate, I think you're missing a trick yeah. here. Well, I've already done it now. Right, okay. I, I don't know, what do I say the, at that the, point? Because I don't want to rip something mm. to pieces, but it's just perhaps the right spec but ill thought out in terms of how to max it's one thing spending a lot of money on a filter it's got to be installed correctly and that but again that comes back to knowledge mm. and understanding i would even encourage people starting out in koi to go with the diy approach and actually learn learn the principles of this stuff you know understand what's going on because it is the way you do it. I remember days I would used to sit sketching out filter designs. I think we're past that now, though. I mean, one obviously from, like, I've involved in a lot more builds, certainly in recent years, than than, than yourself. Mm. Uh, and one of the go-to comments is, I want a koi pond, but I don't want to do anything. It's just classic modern-day yeah. mentality, and it's not. Any other hobby yeah. with that involves animals, if you said, I want a dog, but I don't want to do anything, you, you'd be, you know what I mean? You'd just be like, well, maybe dogs aren't for you. No, no, I mean, that's great if you're super wealthy and can afford someone to do all the stuff you don't want to do for your dog or your pond, but the reality is that's that's not the case for many. So 
yeah, I'd say in that case, it's not really the the hobby, you know. For you, you talk about maximizing budget, you know, one of the most, the real things here is you add layers of expense in making a pond more hands-free, if you want to say, yeah. more, more yeah, hands-on. Yeah, yeah, sure because you're then looking at automated equipment like drum filters for cleaning all the rest. The trick here is not to get consumed into the mindset of you must have this mm. in order to achieve X, Y, and Z. That's the bit I, I want to get hung up on here is that, you know, cause it's not the case. You can quite easily achieve the same results just in a slightly different way. If you boil a drum filter down for me, looking at it, a drum filter, the big, the big upside to it is not the fact you don't have to clean it. It's the fact it removes waste from the water body on a really frequent basis. So the incoming water caught on the drum clean and then it's gone. It's no longer sat in the water. That to me is the one big highlight and takeaway from that, in my opinion. And yes, it does it in an automatic way. Some of the automation and drum, I think is the biggest part of the downfall. The sensors for one. Mm. You know, a guy I know who's been in drum manufacturing has been looking at ways just to put that all on manual timers. So you can actually control when the drum comes on and how frequently it cleans for. Makes perfect sense to me. That to me would eliminate all the problems and issues I have because it takes automation away from it to the biggest extent. I .e. just wait until the water level drops because some of the problems is if the float doesn't re-trigger yeah, correctly, sticks, yeah. mm. there's, there's game over. And so it's just that initial case of getting that set up and then we're away. So yeah, it's, it's that to me is boil each piece of equipment down to its core function and then relook at how that could be done without all the glitz and the glamour and the brand and everything attached to it or pressure, peer pressure from, you know, groups of friends and stuff you're involved in. So yeah, drum filler, right, what's that? Boil it down, waste from the water. What do the breeders do? So the question really in that is, do I need to be removing waste from the water body every five minutes or every 10 minutes? Or is it just okay that we maybe did that once a day? As opposed to, if we look at multi-bay life from years back, that probably got clean once a week there or, you know, twice a week at a push. So yeah. in that process, all that waste was sat in that filter for a whole week. Yeah, we can improve on that. That said, the systems I run, I'm going off topic here, but the, the, the tempons that run with the brush chambers, they are done once or twice a week, depending. I still get phenomenal results in them. Uh, but no, if we look at it, boil it down and drum fill. So the breeders have a really simple design. They have a standpipe. You've seen them, the pits yeah. can fall into and, and <laughs> Almost lose one. all kinds of limbs. <laughs> yeah. So right there, what they do is every day, the first thing in the morning they do is pull the standpipe that purges all the waste sat in that drain directly to waste, straight out of the bottom drain, bump to there. Their filtration primarily actually runs through a mid-water inlet, so it's taking much cleaner water into the filter system. So once a day, they've discharged everything sat in that drain and it's gone. Right there, that is phenomenal in itself compared with how most people are doing it. If you're running any kind of submerged filter that's not automated and you're only cleaning it even every two days, so say you've got a Nexus, you know, phenomenal bit of kit, but say you've got that and you are cleaning that once a week or twice a week, this standpipe method is already more efficient than than that in that respect because you're only getting that, pur that drain purge twice a week as opposed to daily like them breeders are doing. The cost of that is negligible mm. to, to set that up. So if you get me with that, you come to showers. What is the principle of the shower? These are probably the best ones because we've not only mentioned about the obsession they've created with flow rates, which I'm saying again, not essential for the majority of people. Turnover rate should really be linked to stocking and feeding. There's no other explanation for me. It makes sense. The heavier stocked you are, the shittier the water is constantly being polluted. You feed in like I am every two hours. That's a, Every two hours, there's a big surge going into the pond. It makes sense that I want to process that through the filters faster because there's just generally more ammonia, more waste in the system that we need to pass through it. So many people, I mean, how many hobbyists have you ever met that stock a pond like I do? There's not many. No. Uh, it might being serious. Yeah, there's yeah. Not, so you know, and I've still got ponds where I'm turning over once every two hours on that basis, you know. So, yeah, shower filters. Not only have they created the issue in people thinking they need to be turning the water over at a crazy rate, you've also been thought into this trap process. Backy showers 
originate from Momotero Koi Farm based around the Baki House media that they developed. I've got some, I've never tried it and I don't think I'll get to the point of ever trying it because there's not one shred of my experience that tells me that's going to light things up differently to any other media. The big thing with a shower, and I still analyze this, especially when I see them used there still and other farms in Japan, I mean, bearing in mind Sakai run empty showers, completely different design, zero media inside them. I think this is where you're going to learn everything you need to learn here. Why is that? The, the principal effect of a shower, when you're smashing that water over at flow rates, again, I still don't see used over here in England. Some of these have got six inch pipes feeding them. I've seen the pumps are so big. Four inch running flat out is generally a minimum. Degassing. Mm. So this instant ammonia break off. All gone. Fuck the media that's inside it. This is what this kind of marketing and influence, the impact that it can have, you know, is that, oh my God, yeah, you know, I need back your house media at 150. Well, I don't even know what it is a box now. It's something absolutely mental. Uh, you just don't need it. Because in a shower, I think that, yes, you, you want a biological media in there. I, I think it's a, gr a great way to add additional filtration, different bacteria groups, because it's the wet-dry groups uh, that will develop you know, slightly differently to your submerged. But the concept is no different, especially when you've got airflow as well, which is in the design. You need that. It's the degassing effect of that shower that really adds the mass benefit to the water. You know, carbon dioxide is a big thing in a system, getting that gassed off properly. Loads and loads of it. Then, yeah, if you get the airflow right, getting more aeration in as well, which is helpful. Uh, and then the media secondary. But again, this is what Sakai do. Sakai don't use these showers for anything other than degassing. That is it. It's a heavy flow rate. It hits The first thing it hits is a stainless steel mesh, which just kind of looks to vaporize the water. And you can actually, when, when you stand near them, you can feel the airflow pattern around them. They're phenomenal. Then they return splashing into the water through a four-inch pipe, I think, or whatever it is. And straight away there, it's the concept. So if you want a shower, it doesn't need to be stainless steel, though one of the most expensive materials you can think mm. of. It doesn't need to be full of bacteria, house media. It can be stacker boxes with pumice stone in. You know, and even there, you know, my shower or trickle towers, I call them trickle towers because they're not really showers, but they are not creating any aeration or degassing effects because they're a closed vessel. There's no airflow. And to have airflow, all you basically need is an open in and out. It's not got to be complicated, but they haven't got that. So in essence, they're a, <laughs> yes, they're a trickle tower, but there's no other benefits to that. Could be rectified quite easily by taking the top off and, you know, even having a tier midway down, just putting a bit of an airing column in. But like you say, it's the concept of it right there that you can boil down and emulate when you've got the knowledge of knowing what it actually does, emulate it with whatever materials you're comfortable with. So when we sort of bring it back to this topic of sort of saving money, we've sort of explored a few sort of issues that perhaps you might come across. I mean, immediately the, the flow rate one rings alarm bells for me because I see so many people, you know, complaining about running costs. Well, immediately there, imme immediately you've got the physical cost of the pump yeah. for a start, yeah, 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 followed by the ongoing running costs. I mean, I... I've said multiple times, people that run their ponds turn them over once every, I don't know, 30 minutes, once an hour, will get no additional. A lot of people say to me, oh, I still oxygenate the water. And I say to people, try knocking your flow rate down and seeing if your dissolved oxygen levels change. Oh, Often they don't. No, I've played around with it, but you've just said something there again. And another reason I see people running bigger pumps is worried about the pull on the drain. Yeah. For waste. Well, I've got a dead simple solution for you. <laughs> it's called a T-piece and a valve. Yeah. Fit to purge. Every, to be honest with you, looking at modern systems, every pond with a gravity-fed system these days should be fit, fitted with a purge. But the thing is, you can even if you don't do that, you can still run the drum dry, for example, and then open the valves. 
Yeah, so completely. It, you know, you've but got I just a, think a lot of weight of water there. That point of doing it for what it costs, T-piece valve that goes straight to ways for a purge, that the cut valve could just be opened once a day, and you know you put a full pull on the drain. That drain does not need to be pulling at that flat-out rate all the time. I've just said to you there, the breeders, once a day, pull a standpipe, and the velocity that goes out will clear that drain yeah, 100%. Well, you've got multiple tons of water behind it. I've yeah. still seen ponds running a drain close to its 18, 20,000 litre an hour, whatever it is, and you're still on a purge, will pull waste through. Yeah. Mm. You know, so that, that that whole concept is completely flawed. But where are we at right now with that concept? We're choosing to pull a drain hard that could just have a purge fitted and then sacrificing running costs sacrificing at retention time and a whole host of different things just got this all just got so mixed up in places like that but you're right there's huge costs associated with that that just aren't necessary so take away from this on this particular section before we move on to other areas is uh, apply knowledge or or use other people's experiences to try and gain advantages yeah plus again just little bits there sprung to mind skimmers you know everyone fits a skimmer line these yeah, days yeah. like it's an absolute you can't run a pond without a skimmer right there is another line that needs managing needs something on it needs a pump you name it don't need it you just don't need it you might want it and most skimmers i don't, I don't know about you have you ever seen one that works really well no well that's the other thing i'm going to team my skimmer into the bottom drain well that kind of negates the idea of having a, you know, mm. what's an inch and a half, two inch pipe going to do compared to a four inch pipe that's fed via, you know, 20 tons of water. You then got to compromise the valves and then yeah. compromise that pull. For, so, yeah, it's all counterintuitive. Layers of complication, yeah. layers of cost, layers of ongoing cost. Because this is what you've got. <laughs> you've got the startup cost, haven't you? And the, the ongoing I Here's a funny one for you. Well, it's not funny, really. It's tragic. But, um, <laughs> customer of mine every time i go around there skimmers full of food there we go and he feeds sake jackpot yeah and i would say There's probably a lot of people out there screaming right now yeah and pond's just been done renovated blah 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 mm -hmm. tens of thousands with you know he's, he's really got yeah, town yeah, with yeah. it fucking hell this skimmer's costing me a lot of money <laughs> ironically again we go off on tangent a little bit how can you feed properly when you've got a skimmer you can't no is that's again I've, well you can but i've you, had to deal yeah. with one of them that ended up actually in a pond with an auto feeder having a bespoke frame built to to basically trap it back which is then an aesthetic problem yeah. i don't give a shit about that but in this case this guy aesthetics were everything and this is somebody who was cutting out pieces of wood to fill in the screw holes standing over it you know so imagine what a feeding frame on top of his pond yeah. was doing but that kept him know. up at night yeah so it's yeah you're right i just i've got no time for it because ultimately nothing, nothing that a you, net wouldn't let, let's just boil this right down to what we're saying is you know getting that bit of knowledge or tapping into this is where again coming back to that choice of dealer will make such a difference to your life getting the right one in those early days you need that trusting relationship because you need to tap into them Trust that they're not going to have your pants down. Trust that they're not just going to oversell your stuff. Trust that they want to have you as a customer for a long time and be successful in the hobby. Plenty of them out there uh, that you want to uh, tap into. I've lost my thread again. Absolutely shot, mate. One of them days, mate. Well, yeah. I'll step in anyway. Yeah. So we're, we're Sorry about move, that, folks. We're going to move on to a, another aspect, which is... I, I, it's not really controversial, but it's just an aspect that maybe... Uh, people don't buy into as much and it's it's completely logical to me and that's heating your pond obviously it's a big expense an added expense now we've got two ways of looking at this firstly is the notion that you must heat your pond to keep coy no you don't i'll just step in there yeah agreed second one is if you want to grow your koi and maximize the size the size of your fish you do need heat agreed so again it comes back to what do you want to achieve out of your pond now for years we've seen a lot of people the you know the outdoor ambient temperature is sub-zero and they're spending a fortune to keep it up to 12 14 degrees just yeah. to tick the fish over 
and we've spoken multiple times about flip that on its head heat the pond in the summer to reach that magic sort of 24 25 yep. period to maximize the growth give them a winter a it's going to cost you a lot less money on running costs and b probably maximize your performance when you can get that magic window of heat in the summer it's a bit counterintuitive because we always think of like heating is essentially winter. against the cold yeah mm. um but it's something that you've probably been banging the drum for for a little while but it Every time I mention it, sort of as a concept, a hobbyist, it's sort of like you get that weird sort of puppy dog look at, you know, when they sort of turn their heads and look mm. at you. So, yeah, I mean, just just my thoughts. It's sinking in. It is sinking in. I think the issue I'm noticing is that it's not sinking in fast enough. We've got loads of things to this, is that I still see this 16 degrees. Honestly, if mm, I hear a yeah. pond being heated to 16 degrees once more time, you're still in no man's land. This is up the old air ominous alley kind of temperature band of spring that I can't wait till the ponds get out of. You know, this is why I've hence I've said it time and time again now. You're either at 18 or above, which is a night you'll keep your fish really well at 18 in top condition. Uh, you can condition them, you can even grow a bit, it gives you loads of flexibility. Or if you're obviously looking to grow them, you go beyond that into the 20s or you go 12 or below. Because honestly, you will see no difference in your fish between kind of 12 and 16. It'll be so, so marginal, what you'll notice at that point. At 16, yeah, your filters will be slightly more active, but you still don't want to be feeding a lot anyway. So yeah, it's a complete waste. And, and now as we see more and more people using heat pumps, I know very little about these, by the way, the technicalities, but I'm led to believe the efficiency output is very uh, much dictated on air temperature. Yeah. So the ratio you're getting in winter is getting closer to that one-to-one -one kind of ratio as opposed to one-to-whatever on the output. So you're not actually even getting the best of it using one of them in winter either. You know, still probably cheaper than, than straight-up electric, I, I don't doubt, but the fact is you're not getting the most of that bit of kit Plus, yeah, summer, it's that key season where you finally get to enjoy things. And what's happening is most of the time with the climate we've got in here in England now, especially, it's just torture for a koi pond. They're struggling to, to get into any kind of growth period for a sustained time. So you can never truly set your auto feeders properly. The whole thing is an absolute shit show. And by then choosing to spend those heating dollars, if you like, if you're allocating that as a part of your pond running budget, in winter, it's just a complete and utter waste, in my opinion, when it could be spent in summer. You're going to get a lot more bang for your buck and really enhance the enjoyment of your pond. Even taking raising out of the equation, you'll add stability, for one, which will reduce the stress that you're going to have. You will get more out of the fish anyway. Just the whole thing is more pleasurable, in my opinion, and it, it just seems to make sense. I think for years it was that adage... You've got a, the fish's immune system sort of switches on at 14 degrees or so and people fell into the trap of thinking that you can't keep fish outside or below that sort of temperature range. Uh, you know, we've seen it time and time again the world over. Carp are quite, or koi are quite uh, adapt at their environment, mm. providing there's some stability. Now, the problem that I encounter quite a lot when I'm out in the field, not so much these days, but certainly back in the day, is hobbyists wouldn't maximize the growth period which then lent to problems during the winter absolutely uh not max you know any 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 living thing particularly if if they're sort of cold-blooded and their their metabolism immune system is dictated by their environment if they don't gain mass when you can yeah you you increase likelihood of getting problems so where people are not feeding enough in the summer, I'm a strong advocate that that's going to have a knock-on effect come winter time because they, they, they're going into winter not being in uh, the condition that they should be. No, you've got it, and you can't feed them up in winter. Yeah. It's bare minimum because this is the whole big thing. You know, and we're talking about heated. Unheated, the summer's even more important. Mm. So if you're going to look to make one change, spending some of that pond budget on heating in summer would be you know, a, a massive change to, to what you're doing. But yeah, 
This is what I mean. You know, all these temperatures for me, the biological before everything is dropping off so much below 18. Like I say, feeding is going to be at bare minimum levels anyway. And I, I just find it bonkers. You can still get a bit of food in at 12 that keep really well. Uh, you know, even at eight, but uh, when you're at 12 and eight, it's just bare minimum. But then also what you'll save there in potential food costs. If you're at 16, you've got to keep a decent amount of food going in there. Still, otherwise you'll find the weight will start coming yeah. off them. And again, if you're at that temperature and not feeding enough, your fish aren't going to be as strong. You know, malnourishment can start to happen if you're not careful. So then, yeah, you know, you've got that added. It's going to be, it might be marginal, but there's savings there to be had from then the lack of food you'll be giving them, you know, when you're cooler through winter anyway. Loads and loads of ways, but I think that one, again, it's just that if you're choosing to spend money on heating, deploy those dollars in the right way. And for me, using it in summer versus winter is the way to go, hands down. Mm, it's uh, a concept that is a bit counterintuitive to a lot of people, but when you actually break down the reasoning behind it, obviously you need to then do the feeding regime, regime justice if you do decide, you know, it'd be fairly pointless to sort of heat to add that yep. extra few degrees in, in summer to only continue feeding a, yep. a, a basic amount. But yeah, if you are sort of, if it's pricking your ears and interest, then yeah, it's certainly worth looking at because all you hear is, oh, Jesus, heat and bills killing me this winter. Completely. Well, I could sort that out for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm with you 100% on that one for sure. So... Yeah, no much more to be said on that one, really. No, no. So the interesting bit, which is the bit that sort of you and I are sort of obsessed with, is maximizing your budget when it comes to buying koi. I thought you were going to say fish food for a minute then for some reason. Uh, I mean, we can do. Well, food is on the list, but... I am exhausted with that one, but it does it does fit into this video. So, yeah, koi, go on, go for it. So, yeah, uh, again, it's about longevity, isn't it? you know, buying a fish today mm. that doesn't float your boat a year later, you know, for me, is false yeah. economy. Uh, how often do we see that? The big thing here, right, is a complete adjustment in mindset. And this this one is hard. I get it because ultimately we're buying something we want to be visually struck by and emotionally moved by. And um, with koi, basically what you're at is there's, there's compromise. Unless you are at the very small percentage of elite hobbyists who can buy koi, like on the posters that surround us on the cover of our, our magazine, you're, you're going to be compromising. Sometimes people don't know where the compromise is. They kid themselves mm -hmm. thinking, I've, I've hit the jackpot here, I'm onto something. But trust me, I often tend to find the compromise comes in the breeder. You know, so some breeders, if you take Sakai, for instance, if you get a three out of three, by that I mean pattern, skin and body, ouch, mm. you're paying for that. Especially with, and you want it in this side because you've got a bit more safety over buying toe side, for example. So you've got a three out of three in this eye, sky's the limit. You're, you're thousands, a bare minimum, up to tens of thousands. And as we've seen at Sakai, millions if you want you know 1.3 for s legend yeah happy days uh there's a fish without compromises that's what it cost <laughs> so yeah and then what i then what i then see is you know obvious where that's not working for them so they'll move to a breeder who might be able to produce a cracking level of skin quality a cracking uh body shape not even always that, to be honest with you, but can produce the skin, an okay body, get the growth, but then also deliver patterns. Or well, right, actually, let me rephrase that. They deliver the pattern with skin and some growth. There's a farm that springs to mind. I'm not going to say it because they're, they're prevalent for it, but the bodies lack big time. Yeah, so they, they do, as far as Sankey go, which is one of the varieties of that farm, skin quality, amazing. Uh, don't doubt it you get a high pattern level for your money. The lineage can actually also grow to 90 plus quite easily. What they will never have is that Sakai-esque body. It's quite an old school lineage and it's got a very slender frame still. There's loads of people out there still expecting that body to come. Mm. It's never coming. They get thicker, don't get me wrong, but they never get the Sakai-esque power over the shoulders type body. Right there is your compromise. And the fish don't really win at shows in Japan, not at any old Japan level. So if you're looking to do that, you've got no hope. 
because uh, its body's not competitive enough. That's the hidden compromise. You can be blinded by the fact you grow, but you're kidding yourself. You ain't getting what everyone else is wanting right now mm. in that powerhouse in body. So, yeah, there's always a compromise. You've just got to kind of figure out what it is. But ultimately, as your bud available budget for fish purchases decreases, the level of risk taking you need to take needs to increase in line with it. That's where we're at. The more security you want in a purchase, the more you've got to be prepared to pay, i.e. the older you need to buy it for one. Uh, it might be that you need it from certain breeders because you know they deliver. Don't matter what it is, you've got to, and yeah, pattern wise, obviously, show us. Well, actually, let's say Shear Up Stories are probably the best example here because this variety has vexed me for years. They're very, very difficult to buy and sell. No, you've you've yeah, encountered yeah, this yeah. absolute nightmare because the general expectation is they want one of them magazine esque ones, stunning black and white pattern, the the checkerboard, all the rest of it. You name it, nice memoir in the head, blah blah blah. The list goes on. Very few of them get to that point anyway, but the ones that get to that point often get reserved for koi shows, which then command a higher price tag. You name it. It's also one of them varieties where if you take the right chance and right risk, you can actually end up with a worldie for a tiny bit of money. Beating the breeder, if you will. Exactly, because what do you need to do at that point? You need to get your head into the ones that aren't really showing a lot of sumi. Mm. You know, a cow, a great example of this. I love a cow, a shiro, because I know the sumi is so reliable at coming through, especially in the UK buy batches of them and fish that were nothing i say nothing my selection criteria when i'm doing it i'm happy to take the risk on them and give them time that's also something you've got to do if you again you don't want to give them time buy them bigger but buy them more expensive yeah yeah, yeah. don't complain about it the uh yeah i'm looking and i just select them on shiroji quality generally and body shape that's it yeah and let them grow give them time and the amount of fish that come out there, even ones that I've not been able to afford the time to, that I knew might do something, then they've gone to other environments, it's just hit the sumi a bit harder, and they've absolutely flourished. So this is something you could uh, come up on a tank of these in a koi store, maybe, you know, 40, 50 pound each, something like that. And yeah, likely one that, if there's any nice pattern ones in there, that uh, they'll have gone already. But it's the stuff beyond that where you want to be. You know, and just give it a chance, have a look, see what underlying pattern might be there, get it, give it a shot. And you will likely then at that point, and what you could also do, which is a really smart way, again, of using that budget, say say they're 50 quid each in that tank, yet there's one swimming around in a main display pond at 500 that's a lot more there and finished in that pattern. You've still not got any guarantees with that. It could react to your water. It could be that it's, if, if we're talking tow size still, it could be that it's baby sumi that showed up a bit more, or it could be the fact it's actually male because the sumi's shown up a lot earlier. That's in cheer up, sorry, particular quite a common trait. In my opinion, what I'm doing is taking 10 of the ones at 50 quid and leaving the one at 500. Because what I've done there is actually spread my risk for a start over 10 fish. And I guarantee you out of those 10, you'll probably end up over the longer term, two years maybe, with maybe one or more good ones or ones that were better than the one initially at 500 especially when we're talking about these kind of price points that to me just makes perfect sense but what you will also end up with out of your 10 is some fish that if you're growing them all on especially some fish in there will still have quality and a resale value so just by you adding the size and bringing that quality up a little bit you can more than likely sell those fish in the second hand market and actually make enough to maybe recover all your costs on the initial purchase and be left with that one or two anyway. Free for your collection. It's a different way of looking at it, isn't it? That's fucking genius to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but you've always, you've got, there's risk. I see too many people balls deep in big once a year purchases and, and they, they become too invested in it. And at that point, there's sort of like no going back, you know, and when something goes a little bit wrong or that fish don't pan out, because to a breeder, that fish probably was just in the, pull with all others thinking yeah that could be all right but i know right now that's a bit flashier looking so i can get a bit more money for it it's price sell yeah. it now it's it's not there's all these varieties out there when you can take this it's one thing i love about golden corn you know you can take a bunch of toast golden corn and end up with a worldie 
Matsukawa Baki, mm. Komonru, Asagi, Otsuka himself has even said this. He generally, he can't predict what he's giving away. I say giving away, what he's, yeah, what yeah. he's selling and letting go. He can't. In the interview we did with him, he literally said, I could be the next champion of Asagi, I could have let go. Because we don't know till they're at a certain age or size exactly what the future brings for him. There are some, obviously, with the experience, he'll be able to be, yeah, you know, yeah. you know, a bit more keen with. But the general premise is, there's that many of them. Who knows? I can't think of any more off the top of my head. But those varieties are awesome, and this is how you can build a real collection. But that same premise, even when we're talking Ghost Anki, you know, if you've got a five hundred quid budget, divide it over, even two. You even if it's the case, go for two at two fifty. Yeah, or five or hundred, whatever it is, ten at fifty, because you're just you're spreading that risk. For what you'll also do, which is invaluable, if you've done ten versus one, you're going to learn at ten times the pace, because you're going to take experience from them ten fish versus that one over that six or twelve months that you're growing it, whatever it is, and that'll become the really invaluable part, which ties back to the very beginning again. You can't put a price on the knowledge. You know, that's the bit. And the more you can do that, I see this is a trap now for a lot of top-end hobbyists who only have one pond, buying that one fish a year. Their skill and refinement in picking high-potential fish has gone out the window. So what happens is they've got an ever an eye that's becoming ever more demanding and maybe the budget and circumstances not changing with that and it leads to massive unhappiness in the hobby. You know, when realistically they could be, even in that case, you know, if they can afford it, a second pond would be a better option for them. And again, taking that budget, which will be bigger for one fish per year and splitting it over a bunch of higher class tosai and doing it that way, the, the model just works. And it's a better way of building up a quality collection at any level, really, apart from if you have got the disposable cash to really go in and buy more mature two or three years. But even then, typically, a lot of people probably don't know what they're looking at still. You know, Nisai, it helps. Sansai, it's a lot easier. If you're buying that age and above, you can have a pretty clear path. But even at Nisai, a lot of the times, it takes a bit of skill. The bit you've got is there's just less risk. That's what happens. I say the older you go, the less risk there is. Uh, uh, everyone wants to secure the future of their court. You know, when they're, they're picking young koi, they've got that vision. Sometimes it's unrealistic vision. Yeah. That's sometimes often the case that you find that people are trying to achieve something that is never within the fish. Mm. I've been there a lot of times where people, hobbyists, will find the answer to the question that they want, not there you go. what they want to hear. Mm. Uh, that's the reality of it, mm. uh, which then leads to disappointment. Managing expectations, the reality of it, yes, you can achieve some pretty pretty epic results to be honest with you I, I read on one of the forums the other day that you know you can't get high quality koi unless the breeder dubs it high quality koi wow yeah but that's the narrow mindedness that we're dealing with you know and the reality of the fact that you've said it before sakai for example his cast offs are probably better than or would be considered tatigoi for the vast majority of breeders in nagata 100% so, 100%. so the, the going back to that knowledge uh, aspect as well, it apply all, apply the knowledge. It all comes out. You know, you can frame it in loads of different ways. At the end of the day, but the the basic premise is is still the same, and the, there is compromises being made, and that's what you just need to be aware of it, and then understand it. But yeah, you're right, mate. It's I don't know. It's fascinating. It really, is fascinating. It's quite a pattern driven hobby in the uk as well we've mentioned yeah. this quite a bit uh, and we sometimes you know if you look at the the pricing structure for, from a fish what what demands the pri high price for a fish you know you've got the three classic categories like you said body skin pattern i need to intervene because there again is your next bit you talk about pattern that's great pattern is so important we probably don't speak about this enough it's the ultimate value decider, the mm. ultimate deciding factor in the value of a coin in the end because it's the bit that makes it the most unique. It's the cherry on the top, isn't it? Japan is pumping fish out with good body and good skin on mass. It's the, it's the standard benchmark for a Japanese koi. So the bit that really decides the value then is the pattern. 
you know, and, and I say that's where a lot of people do end up compromising, but do you have to compromise? No, you can say, well, I want body, skin and pattern. That's great. There's your compromise again, because you're going to have to make one male and female mm. straight away I'm saying it. The gap, the gap is narrowing all the time. There's such a monumental shift in the way breeders are starting to sell fish now that as I've kept saying, it won't be long before the gap is almost gone. You know, because unsexed is being more and more, but even people just advertise them outright as male breeders because they know now the good lineages, they still fetch serious money if the patterns are good. Good show fish. Exactly, exactly. No, nothing to worry about in terms of getting eggy. No, but then that that is your compromise. But why not? Why not build a stunning collection of three out of threes and have them all male? Because you got, if you've not seen the video already that I've been sharing on my coil sale stuff in one of the Q&As, my male pond is mind blowing mm, yeah agreed. i have no issue saying that i know it is fucking spectacular and i am fully aware that if all those fish were female i wouldn't have that pond there yeah it's the stigma that's attached to it i don't think it's always been around yeah always been around yeah. um but yeah I, I think you're right yeah, that, that is a that is an ideal compromise to make mm. There's just, it doesn't matter what you do, there's always one there. You need to be aware of them and understand, you know, what, what it is you're getting into and what it is you're buying. But yeah, for me, the way to maximize your budget for buying koi is, is that exactly as I've, is that dilute your risk, take whatever budget is you're planning on spend and buy more fish with it at whatever level because you will increase your knowledge at an exponential pace compared to a one, two fish a year. If you're buying 10, 20 a year, whatever it is, and you'll always have a place to move them on to. Yeah, I can't disagree with too much you said there, mate. So we sort of covered pond side of things, the fish side of things, the running costs side of things. Probably the final point to talk about is the consumable side of things. So every pond is going to require some upkeep, you know, the main one being food. Yeah, I know this is something that's sort of ingrained in you, and I know you've, you've been challenged a bit recently. So yeah, I know you're fired up for this. I'm not fired. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I am exhausted. I'll just reiterate this point. You know, if people cannot see, if you've been following what I do for a while now, see the results. I'm literally telling everybody what I'm doing and the, the main reasons why I'm getting the success that I'm getting doing it. The biggest unique part of this formula is the high stocking levels smallish ponds high stocking levels and then still getting performing how i am doing there's only one reason right now and that's the food there's there's no other way of dealing with that because if just if any other diet was producing marginally more waste physical waste or whatever it is going on there the whole thing would fall apart it's it's that kind of fine and i've just got a different way of looking at this you know i fully 100 percent back saki akari not just as a uh as the best food as actually one of the, i say it, the best koi product ever made specialist product ever made it's just above and beyond there is a reason i believe it's like that i mean it is unique in the sense of the akari germ which i believe is really part of the success of it is patented it isn't something that can be copied done it's patented there's not many koi foods that can say they've got painted tech. protection okay, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's not just that there's obviously super high quality ingredients that seem to just differentiate that in japan completely it's an imported product but i have seen over the years there's a few modern brands i haven't used but i've seen what it's all about i know it'll be a pile of shit because i've used that many over the years i know what they're all like i know what they do i've put them through their paces I'm not just chucked a little bit in and said oh god that it produces a little bit more waste than than the other one after a week that's not where this is at. These have been pushed and used at the highest levels with me actually understanding and seeing all the small details that they produce as well. But nutrition is probably the single most important thing. We've seen this now, because I'm quite into this in life anyway, uh, nutrition in people and gut health and all this and everything it stems from. For me, that's just no different with Koi. Super, super important. And although there's a lot of, there's good foods out there, there's shit foods out there there's better than good you know and then there's where saki is and yeah for me 
the mindset with this, I think the initial thing with the likes of Saki Car is to look at the price and go, wow, I'm not paying that for a bag of that. If you actually look beyond all that stuff, and this is what I've been trying to preach, there's a really, really high conversion ratio with Saki Akari in kilos fed to kilos gained across the fish collection. In their research, I've actually got the paper on it, they got, a, I think it was 130% conversion ratio, which is just fucking mind-boggling as to how you fed a kilo and gained 1.3 kilos in weight in collection. I mean, that's just hard to compute. But even if you consider, nah, bullshit, or what, 100% conversion ratio, then 90%. I've just seen it with other foods. It doesn't happen like that. You know, the food I was feeding before, I had to feed disproportionately high amounts to the point where the system couldn't handle it. Obviously, when that happens, everything falls apart. You can't get the quantity down, and the appetite's not as stimulated, the water's harder to manage, swings and roundabouts. You just, that's just one small element there. But to me, you don't understand the true value of a fish food until you can understand the conversion ratio. Because in all reality... The best guiding force, I believe, is my scenario here because this is operating as a business. Profitability is important in all this and costs, costs are super important. So if I could you know, I could shave 50% off my food bill, which is fucking ball busting, <laughs> I wouldn't. I would be jumping all over it. But why then? Because more than likely, the likelihood is if I found something at 30% less cost, but then the conversion ratio is 30, 40% less. False economy. Yeah. Better off. And that that's just looking at weight, never mind looking at, and this is the bit that really gets it, the color condition, yeah. the skin luster. That skin luster I'm achieving is I've only seen it as good in Japan, in fish generally out of mud ponds. You know, that's 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 where that's at. And, and then really high-level breeders who really also know how to raise fish indoors really well. It's the food. It's a combination of, yes, how I keep the water, but this is coming from inside out. You know, there's not, I'm not allowing external influences to have an impact on that mucus, but the quality and health of that slime coat, which ultimately dictates that, comes from inside, as you full well know. And I just don't think there's many other products up to the job. No, I mean, every time I go and see a client, I can almost tell whether they're feeding this food or not. Mm. That's the impact visually to someone that's in tune with it. Mm. That's the difference that it makes. And I think, yeah, that is a testament to, to the product itself. A lot of people want, again, they want to find an answer that contradicts what we're saying and they, they will find it somewhere. You know, if, if you're that uh, way inclined to go, I'm not justifying that price, that's fair enough. Yep but you can't really deny the facts. No. And this this is a fact. I'm not having it any other way. I'm loving all the marketing hype at the minute around FD. I love how my own words have actually been tried to be twisted and used back against me as well. Yeah, FD, if I couldn't get Saki, FD would be my next choice. Yeah, it's yeah. a really premium. But as I'm seeing, it's already more expensive than Saki Akari is. And I know it's not as good. Why do I know? I've used it before. I couldn't get up to the levels that I'm at at the minute of feeding to make the system that I've got work. There will be people out there have great results from it, absolutely yeah, no yeah, doubt. Sure. And those two foods then compared with most other things in the market are out on another level. But I know Saki is edged way, way above it. Like I say, it's actually then a cheaper alternative to the FD, which I find bonkers. But it's, again, people there buying into marketing hype. All the top readers are using it. You know, this one's absolutely blue my mind it's like i've never been to japan you know and yeah you know not even that between fd and ikari a lot of breeders don't even use either because even in japan they're premium foods and big farms will make differences but i've seen what they're like you know it could be a commercial decision based around a kickback or, or whatever it is because they are both good so the tipping point might be something like that but the relevant fact the, the, is the endorsement of it because of yeah yeah yeah, yeah. gain yeah yeah Relevant fact is, you've seen enough evidence from what I've done to see why. And you've seen the results. I just, I just think I can't say much more about it. The what? bit I am mindful of, sorry, mate, is obviously I don't want people listening to this feeling like if if it truly is unobtainable, yeah. even based on the fact that uh, oh, 
what I'm saying. Even based on the fact that if you buy a bag of that, you might have to buy a bit more of another brand to get the same kind of weight gains and stuff like that. Don't want them feeling like they're doing a disservice to their koi collection and feeling like shit because, you know, their circumstances just can't allow it. What I am asking you to do is really look at, you know, what you're doing and say, well, look, is it really that much of a difference just to take that step up but get maximum, maximum benefits because you could eliminate so many things just in the increased potential health and resistance of your food being better nourished might reduce medication costs yeah. throughout yeah, yeah. the year. Uh, there's loads of other ways, you know, you might do, you, you don't need to be throwing, if you're spending money on chucking additives into water, I don't know, X amount on clay a year or a bacteria, fucking get rid of all that, scrap it all, use that money to buy the best food well, he, that you he, can. You know, we discussed it earlier, but save yourself 20, 30 quid on running costs a month. There you go. That's your food sorted for yeah. the year. All, all these little bits and that then is maximizing because trust me, this is, and not only that, you know, learning how to feed, but that's another topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But having the best food, this this stuff is freakish. It's that much for, for what I've seen. I'm wondering what is actually in it. I'm thinking, can it really just be this bacteria? That these results are so exceptionally different to everything else. So that's what I'm asking. If it's really unobtainable, then, then fair enough. There are foods out there that will give your fish that basic level of nourishment. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but do everything that you can, in my opinion, to adjust the way you're doing things to try and make that a viable option. And it is one of them products, and there's only reason, and I've said this time, I get absolutely nothing from Ikari, which is really bad on them, to be fair, because I think the fucking boost I've given that product over the past couple of years is disproportionate. Yeah, I laugh, but yeah, it's uh, I, I, can, I can vouch that, <laughs> You know, a lot of people think that you're getting kickbacks and it's backhanders. Fucking, and... It, honestly, it's shocking, really. But I, I just feel that so strongly about this yeah. in, mm. in what it is. It's part of what my, you know, part of my core fundamentals of koi keeping. I don't you I chuck a odd bit of clay in every now and again. I'm not religious with that even. The main thing is I spend all that budget and money on that food. And I wouldn't want to change. If it did leave the market, I would be devastated. Mm. Yeah, it's out there on its own, but that's that's why I believe so strongly about it because it's not you cannot just look at the price of one other because no koi food yeah. is cheap. You get right down into the realms, you know, sticks, all that stuff. I can't even comment really. I was trying to think of something, and so, <laughs> I think I'm just going to leave that one. Yeah. Um, so when you get into the realms of even good foods versus this, I'm going to eliminate that category we've just mentioned. So you know, the good foods versus this that's when your difference becomes even smaller. So it's not much of a big step to go from that to that. But I just believe and it's one of them products everybody notices as the difference. Yeah. Just that, I've mentioned PSB bacteria. I was in the last episode, I can't remember. That's another one over the years proved itself to be really worth its weight in gold because people use it and see it. I don't think there's many products that often in this industry do deliver like that, such a stark, noticeable difference. And every time I hear the same thing, I've tried it for the first time, there's no going back. And that's as much as I can keep saying on it, mm. really. You know? Well, I think, you know, I like to think we've covered quite a few topics there, core, core topics that, you know, if you sit down and analyze your expenditure over a year of a pond, there's some... We're not talking about making savings for the sake of making savings. We're talking about maximizing the budget that you do yeah. have to enhance your hobby. Don't waste money in areas where you may gain yeah. in others, for example. So don't break things that aren't, don't try and break things. Oh, fucking hell, where have I gone? If it ain't that? broke, don't fix it. Yeah, that's it. Because I've seen that as well with the whole food thing recently. This, this, this kind of shit blows my mind. I've been using sake, but I think I'm going to give FD a try this year. Why? You're using it, you're happy with it, you're getting good results, but I think I'm going to give that a try. It's all part of thinking you're in with the, the, the click or, you know, whatever's going on. Just trust me, marketing hype is fascinating, uh, but it does what it says on the tin. Mm. And to take it from me, and I've got enough evidence sat behind me now anyone else wants to come out there and put the name to something or get behind something just ask them for what evidence and proof they've got 
because I've two years now putting it out there for you to see. I still say it, it's I choose to disproportionately spend in that area of the business because that stuff is out there on its own. So, yeah, yeah, pretty convincing, mate. Not that you needed, uh, not that many people needed convincing anyway. But no, that's also the the fun bit with that, really, isn't it? I mean, I I don't know why I keep doing it. That's because of how strongly I believe yeah. it. Because I get fuck all so. I hope Ikari is listening to that, actually. Or certainly not them. Shout out, Ikari. <laughs> the distributors in the UK. Because uh, I hope I hope to God they're not sat in the boardroom past couple of years, giving all a good pat on the back for, for the growth of that stuff. Uh, well, I'm sure someone's done quite well out of it, mate. <laughs> yeah, not me. <laughs> all right, well, on that note, guys, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll draw this one to an end. And, uh, yeah, hopefully it's been of interest to you. So, yeah, I'll see you all on the next one. Cheers, folks. Mm -hmm.